Okay, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this week's uh, Let's Talk Dairy webinar. So as I said last week, I'm just going to do a very brief one today, um, and I'm going to just look at a little bit in relation to the financial side of the business. Uh, it's probably, I suppose, it's the piece of, it's the element of the jigsaw, or the piece of the jigsaw that people are probably least inclined towards. I know some people are very um, oh, fanatical, is, is one way of describing it, maybe uh, other people quite quite obsessed with their figure side of things. But the vast majority of farmers that I come across are very happy farming and doing the, uh, the day to day work and uh, focusing on that. And when it comes to figures, they don't really want to to be working in that space too much. Really, they want to do as little as they can around that, do what they have to do for accounts and so forth and kind of let other people maybe guide their business in that sense. So uh, that's not really a great way to operate, I suppose. It's important that, you know, I suppose there's two things to it. I suppose in my mind, you need to know the cost of things, but you also need to know the value of things. And both of those things may not be the same, but knowing the cost of things, it, it helps you to put a value on certain elements of your business and so forth. So what I mean by that is that if you know how much it's costing you to do a certain, or to, to keep your cows, etc., and you want to buy something that's going to maybe make your life a little bit easier, you know you're in a position to pay for that item because you know your cost base and that you can afford it. Many people probably want know the value of something and want to buy it and go and buy it and may not be in the position to afford it uh, for various reasons because it may be stage of life uh, in terms of development costs already incurred or maybe just because of um, children in college, et cetera, which is an extremely expensive time for people uh, and is a big drain on cash uh, on farms when at that stage. And, and as is quite often the case, there's often more than one child in college at, at any given time, or there's, a pro, or there's a period of time maybe where there's people in college for over four or five, six, seven year period because of people constantly going through the, pro, going through the college phase. So it can be quite expensive at that stage. So I suppose what I want to talk about today, look, there's a new profit monitor system. Uh, profit monitor isn't new, obviously, but there's a new profit monitor available for the coming year. Kevin Connolly deserves huge credit for the work that he's done. Uh, Kevin won't be a person that maybe might be very familiar to a lot of you, but Kevin is the man who developed profit monitor in the first place. And he's been working on this in the background. And I know that people on the call will be saying that I've been talking about this for a long time. And I probably have, but it's it's not it's not Kevin's fault that we haven't been in a position to deliver this, as uh, obviously a sum of money had to be invested into the reprogramming of the of the new system and budgets, etc., have to come into play. So Kevin has had this in in its in a in a cupboard, basically, I suppose, or on, in, on his computer with the last two years and had the idea of how he wants it to go. And now it's going it's actually coming to fruition so there's some minor changes that are not going to go into particularly today but um more more cost breakout basically so contractor costs can be broken down into slurry and silage etc contract rearing which is a very common criticism in the last number of years is now capable of being dealt with in a lot better way on the profit monitor and also that there's consolidated reports over the replacement enterprise is now going to be considered as part of the whole business as opposed to just looking at the dairy business and then maybe having a replacement uh, enterprise that was actually losing money might, as might be the case with the way people were uh, attributing costs towards the dairy business etc and not giving any or not putting a lot of costs against replacements that mightn't be justified so i suppose um just in by way of um just introduction, I suppose, as to why. So this this slide obviously says profit monitor. There's a rebrand. Obviously, you'd be familiar with um, how companies rebrand things, and obviously this is is important to Chagas as well that we kind of protect the profit monitor brand as well. So there's a new image associated with profit monitor, and the reports are going to change, and there's going to be watermarks on on report pages, etc. So um, that's all part of the the redevelopment piece as well. Uh, and this is the new logo for us. But I suppose what I will say from the outset, look, from my perspective, when I walk into a firm and we have profit monitor information, it makes it an awful lot easier to start charting courses for people in terms of are they expanding? What's their succession plan? Are they stepping back? What way they're going to work? If you have financial information, that's good. And that's very important. This was very, very important point to make. Rubbish in, rubbish out. 
uh, and we're often get, get given out to, about producing figures and so forth. But at the same time, there's a responsibility on people that do complete profit monitor to submit proper good to submit good figures as well, because um, I don't know any business, uh, and I've often come across them where that can manage to do everything to the round figures of a uh, thousand euro and 1500 euro and 1550 and 1100 euro so I, I don't buy that that's correct information it's a kind of an estimate and then at the on the flip side of it we have people then complaining about us using this information now george is responsible from the specialist team in in uh, in the dairy side of the house of looking after that profit monitor analysis piece that he used to do there in the past and he used to clean data as was as is how you describe it in order to try and make the the information that would be presented as as re representative as possible so a lot of those poor quality information profit monitors would be left out of the analysis that george would be doing but in in the long and short of it is if you're going to do a profit monitor do it right or don't bother doing it at all and again that flies in the face of what i'm trying to promote here i suppose look Chagas would love more people to be doing profit monitor. We'd love to see more people grass measuring as well, and we're working on that all the time. And we'd be hoping that this uh, new iteration of profit monitor will help bring people forward. But the context of today's talk is probably more so around knowing your costs. Profit monitor plays a role in that. Um, it, it helps you to look at costs in in a, a kind of a, a, a planned, kind of designed way that, that Kevin has produced, obviously. But that's not to say that you can't establish your own costs. Um, there's many people with farm diaries and so forth with lots of stuff written into it um, that they use to, to establish their costs. And some, some people that I know that are excellent at financial management don't use any kind of computers, but they have all very good notes in terms of either a ledger or, as I said, a farm diary that they keep figures in. And when it comes to planning, they're able to rack off the figures, how much it cost them for fertilizer, how much it cost them for feed for to do their business for the previous year and what they're planning on doing for the coming year. And, and that's that works for them. So that's fine. So the key element of today is really that we're trying to get people to establish their costs. And the reason for that is you'd say, why, why, why worry about it? Like bank balances are probably not in a bad shape this year after the good milk price year. Fertilizer prices were low at the start of the year, so the majority of fertilizer that was bought was relatively cheap. Feed stayed okay for a good bit of the year, even, even though it was at the high side probably at the start of the year anyway, and but has crept up obviously as well. Um, and the Outlook Conference on Tuesday from the um, Rural Economy section of Chagas have suggested that there's going to be a 16% reduction in, in uh, profit from dairy enterprises in 2022 because of increasing uh, costs. So fuel costs have gone up. Likelihood is contractor costs will go up on foot of that. Fertilizer is going to be high and uh, feed is going to be high as well. So we need people to establish their their uh, cost per cow, basically, I think is uh, is quite a good figure to work from because you can it's a very tangible figure. So if you have 100 cows and you know it costs 1,000 euros a cow to keep them or 1,500 euros a cow to keep them, you very easily can put establish what kind of figure you're looking at in terms of costs for, tw for 2022 potentially uh, and then add on what the extra is going to be. So I suppose the dairy conference a couple of weeks ago, as you will be aware, went online. The original plan was to do face to face and we had a number of presentations that were planned for the middle section of the day. Uh, and some of you may have seen it and some of you may have not, but Patrick going and James Dunn, who worked with me in the dairy specialist team as well, had done this piece. And uh, they, I, I suppose, they, oh, I don't, it was sent out on um, online subsequently as a video. And some people have seen it and more people haven't maybe, but it's a, an interesting piece of work, I suppose, from the two lads. So they've looked at uh, the data that we have to hand in terms of cost per cow and so forth. And if you see here, uh, costs have crept up anyway, in spite of a lot of the, we'll say, uh, there's a lot of focus this year on, on fertilizer going into, into 2022 and feed costs as well. But costs have actually crept up. So you can see that from 2015 through to, we'll say, 2020, that there's been a rise in, in the costs. And I would have said probably on previous uh, episodes about kind of costs would always be in around 900 to 1100 euros probably was the old rule of thumb that we used to work off of and what dictated it was um basically whether it was good year or bad year maybe or depending on input costs how high or, or uh, otherwise they may have been 
Um, but you can actually see that when we look at the 2015 figure that the, the upper end of what was the, the old rule of thumb at 1100 is now the lower uh, end of the scale. And the 2020 figure has, has brought that up to 1300. So where is that coming from? I suppose you can see here that the fixed costs, I suppose, have increased marginally, relatively speaking, because it's only talking about 80 euro uh, in 480 euros of a cost in the original case in 2015. So the main creep in cost is coming from variable costs. Fertilizer, as you'll see, so feed, I suppose we'll focus on the feed first. Obviously, feed has gone up by 78 euros um, in terms of the amount of it used. It does 78 euros more being used on the average farm. Um, from 2020 to 2015, uh, or vice versa, sorry. And from in fertilizer costs actually dropped um, over the last number of years. And, and that 2020 obviously was quite, um, there was quite a lot of cheap fertilizer, I suppose, a relatively cheap fertilizer bought at that stage. And then I suppose maybe th th you could attribute some of this to veterinary costs, et cetera, potentially because we say there's more vaccination beginning to take place on herbs and so forth. Um, and uh, there's, look, there's other bits and pieces in there as well, but that's just one thing that springs to my mind that more people are probably vaccinating for more now. So that's another cost that's increasing. And again, I suppose, look, there's general inflation costs inside there as well. So you can see that there's been 100 and nearly 120 euros of an increase uh, in, in those variable costs from 2015 up to 2020. And, as, and then you draw in the 80 euro of costs from uh, 2015 to 2020 in terms of fixed costs. And we're very close to 200 euro difference. You can see that that, that was just under 2% of an increase from 15 to 17. And then we're closer to 3.5% of an increase from 17 to 20. And that figure is going to go higher, obviously, because on foot of fertilizer and feed for the coming year. I suppose just to focus on the predicted kind of costs or kind of throwing it forward, you can see here that the fertilizer cost is almost double for 2022 versus 2020. Um, there's a, a very marginal change here in relation to the other variable costs. So the only cost that the lads have changed here really are the feed and fertilizer because they're the main ones that are going to change um, and small little rise in terms of fixed costs here as well. So you can see that we've now gone from a 50, uh, 1300 euro. So we've gone up 200 euro already uh, here. And we're now saying that this is going to be a further to, uh, 200 euro increase in costs associated with dairy farming in 2022. Uh, so from that point of view, I suppose, as I said, all of what I've just said is just important that people can establish this figure here for 2021 and then make the decision uh, or will put that in the context of the plan for the 20 year of 2022. So what's the plan in relation to milking cows or number of cows that are going to be milked, et cetera, for 2022 uh, and make the financially prudent decisions around that. So I suppose, as I said, it's going to be short today. Uh, so I'll summarize it in, in this way, I suppose. The cost of keeping your average cow is projected to increase 200 euro um, from compared to 2020 figures. Um, and that could even be up a small bit this year because there will be slightly higher costs associated with uh, feed and fertilizer coming through. Maybe a small bit of a reduction um, in output then will also hit people because we didn't have a good May. So uh, overall, we're behind a little bit in terms of uh, fat and protein percentages, which could have a, an impact, but then I suppose milk price will probably compensate for that. But it's very, very important. And as I said, while we'd love you to be doing profit monitor, as long as people establish their own figure. Now, by right, that should be written down in such a way that you can go back to it at some point rather than the back of the cigarette box calculation, as, as uh, people talk about. And then the cigarette box gets thrown into the recycling and, and the good work is gone for naught, basically. So put it in a diary somewhere where you can go back to it. I suppose the key thing is that feed and fertilizer, and it came out again in the Outlook conference on Tuesday as well, 40% of those of, is of total variable costs are coming from those areas. So there is scope around that, I suppose. We need to be smart in terms of use of fertilizer and trying to buy it, obviously, for the coming year as well. And then feed, uh, I suppose, like we'll always get um, challenged with that. We always talk about reducing feed, but there is scope to make small reductions in feed amounts uh, in 2022 that are going to save you relatively significant sums of money, I suppose. So if we only just take, for example, feed at 350 a ton at the moment, if people are feeding a ton of, of ration per cow and they can save 100 kilos, then they're obviously going to save uh, 35 euros per cow across the course of the year. And that's not a huge amount uh, or a huge change 
in terms of the amount of feed being fed, it's actually probably only going to be less than half a kilo across the whole main grazing season. So grass management comes into that. If we can get the right grass, there we can manage to feed less. And to um, I suppose I reference a previous uh, colleague of ours, Billy Kelleher, that was uh, very, I suppose, astute in terms of some of the sayings that he used to have. And he used to have a saying that um, in relation to feed and grass, if you're if your grass is wrong and you're feeding too heavy, you're wasting both the feed and the grass. Uh, so if we can get the grass right, we actually don't need to have as much feed in and we can still get the same output. So I suppose there's a fear there all the time that if we drop back in concentrate usage, that we lose performance. That doesn't have to be the case. So I suppose a bit more uh, smart use of, of feed, maybe for 2022, I suppose, is going to be important. Fertilizer thing, as you know, is very contentious at the moment, when to buy, how much to buy, um, and just even my product to buy, etc. So look, I think we'll, we're going to cover that next week in terms of pricing products and in terms of what's value for money and what's not value for money and so forth. Uh, that's an important piece. The next piece, look, we've touched on it in relation to nitrate storage requirements, um, greenhouse gas emissions to a certain extent, I suppose, without necessarily getting overly hung up on it. And uh, you'll have seen there maybe recently that Frank O'Mara, our new director, has come out and, and indeed so has Minister McCon McConnell Log, saying that a call of the national herd is not necessary. However, there are cows and in most herds, possibly somewhere in the region of 5 to 10% of cows that aren't cutting the mustard, basically. They're not covering their costs. And as a result of that, they don't have a place in your business. And it's actually financially wise from, from your perspective to eliminate those animals from your herd as much as anything else. And it, look, it can create uh, other wins in terms of stocking densities in sheds, et cetera, as well. But the most important thing here is to know the figure. So this is knowing your own figure in terms of the costs of keeping, the, keeping that cow. And are, if they're not covering their own costs, then you have to seriously question why are they um, in, on the farm at all. And the likelihood is that there's probably young stock coming through maybe that are going to outperform those older stock um, and in reality, if you consider it, if you're losing money on an animal, you're obviously robbing Peter to pay Paul because there's other animals that are carrying the cost of those animals. And if we put it in the context of what I said here about trying to reduce our feed and fertilizer usage, there's scope to cut back a little bit if we have a few less stock, maybe potentially. Um, every case is going to be different. But we'll say if you're feeding, if you're on the on the edge of of the on the on the edge of the abyss, I suppose we'll call it in terms of stocking rate on farm, etc. And and a lot of those cows are as as can be described being fed. Coming back to what Joe said about marginal cows, maybe a couple of weeks ago, if they're being fed on all bought in feed, if we eliminate those, we can reduce the amount of bought in feed that has to come in, which is going to be a very positive win in terms of cost base for 2022. And then the final piece, I suppose, the temptation will be there to cut the cloth to fit the table, but people could cut the table or cut the cloth too tight. Um, it's important in terms of fodder budgets and so forth. And fodder budget was done this year on a, on a cohort of farms, we'll say, and the plan is to do that on an ongoing basis every year. So not because we're in a, in a bother, but because we want to have a handle on what kind of fodder stocks are in the country. And I think we have something in the region of 15 to 20% surplus silage basically on the dairy farms that filled in that survey. So there is scope probably to potentially to reduce the amount of silage that will be cut in 2022. But we don't know what the, the, the next couple of months are going to bring in terms of the weather. We are in a very, very good position. Um, Michael O'Donovan uh, showed me data there the other day in relation to where grass growth is currently. Uh, obviously, people will see that themselves been quite strong and um, so we're actually setting ourselves up quite well even though we've been grazing probably later than we would have in other years around the country we're actually still in quite a good position to open um covers in our opening covers will be good come february hopefully uh, so that will put us in a strong position to leave some silage in the yard but it, it, we have to bear in mind that you still need silage in 2022 23 for the winter period there and if you're going to grow a crop of silage, you need to fertilize that crop in order to grow it. So you need to, but you need to do that wisely. So you need to know what your slurry uh, is going to produce in, in terms of N, P and K for you. And then you're topping that up with, with your chemical nitrogen um, in order to produce that crop of silage. Uh, but again, we can be wiser, wise here. We don't need to use some of the heavy rates of nitrogen that I've heard of in the past and on top of slurry. We can quite safely get away with maybe 
70 to 80 units and potentially less depending on the quality of slurry we've seen some cases where slurry has been quite good and you could actually get away with slightly less but on average you're probably talking about somewhere in the region of 70 to 80 units that could be potentially a, a, a 20 percent saving on fertilizer for some people because some people are inclined to go with 100 units um, not accounting for slurry and that's a waste of, of fertilizer so i suppose just to summarize for today if you take nothing away from the presentation apart from that you need to know the cost of keeping the cows on your farm uh, for 2021 we're coming into the quiet period or the so-called quiet period i suppose on dairy farms as people dry off cows that piece of the jigsaw is, is now been removed and um, so there is a little bit more time maybe not notwithstanding that people are busy in the yards uh, having to feed stock and, and everything but there can be time to sit down and pull the pull all the invoices together put everything together it's a, a benefit from the an accountancy point of view as well that you have your stuff ready um, and it will put you in a position to do a profit monitor if you're interested in that and we'd be very happy to facilitate people that are interested in that but the key thing to take from today is that we want people to uh, establish their costs and and know where they stand in, in terms of that so look that's uh, that's it for today um I'll leave it at that. And as I say, we're going to talk about nitrogen again next week in terms of pricing it uh, and trying to, I suppose, maybe we might look a little bit as well in terms of the plan around nitrogen for 2022 as well, given the cost of it and where that sits. Uh, because as I said there, in relation to the silage, it's no different with grazing. People are going to have to spread nitrogen to grow grass and feeding concentrate and silage inside in, in sheds in the springtime isn't going to grow grass for you. So there is uh, a nitrogen requirement there, but it's been smart around that. So I suppose thanks for tuning in this morning. I hope you uh, got some value from that. And as I said, sit down and um, pull those costs together and at least know your figure for what your cow is costing you to keep. And I'll be back next week. In the meantime, take care and farm safely and stay safe in relation to COVID. So thank you. Bye-bye.